Hello everyone. Today we're taking a look at practicing a variety of proofs. Here in the notes that we're going through, we have pretty much different combinations of ideas we've been working with before. So there's nothing really new here. I just a couple of details to point out within the examples, but by this point, you've already seen all of the ideas introduced. Now we're just bringing them together to create a logical argument. So what I really want you to do is I want you to first try these on your own, then watch the video to see if you've got the right answer, as well as just to hear the thinking that we need to go through to solve the problem itself. All right, so first you try this, then come back to the video and see if you got the right answer. Now, as we set this up to solve, we have two pieces of given information. We have some parallel lines, and you notice that we have two sets of lines. And even though it looks like line P and line R are parallel, you can't go by looks because that's what we're trying to prove. In other words, they're not parallel yet. We don't know that they're parallel yet. So we only can work with the fact that these two lines are the parallel lines, G and H, and they are already marked here and here with those arrows inside. And we're also told that one is congruent with two, so that is not marked on the diagram, so I'll go ahead and mark that like so. What that means is when we're starting off with this given piece of information, normally in the past we've been writing both pieces of given information at the top, and we totally can, but just to show you something a little bit different, do you see how we have split up the givens? Did you know we could do that? We certainly can. We can take each of the two given pieces of information and split them up. What that means is here we're focusing just on the idea of the parallel lines and what that can do for us, where on line 5 we're focusing on the other angle pair and what that can do for us. So we'll come back and talk about how we jump from line 4 to line 5. But notice that in this case. So if we have parallel lines, we're then directed to look at angles 1 and 3. You can see angles 1 and 3 are both touching line P. That means we're ignoring the bottom half of the diagram. So if parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then these angles, 1 and 3, that we're talking about here next, what are those called? Those are called corresponding angles. So let's think of an if and then statement connecting lines 1 and 2 together. So we would say if parallel lines, then corresponding angles are congruent. So again, a common mistake is simply to say if parallel lines, then angles congruent, forgetting to mention the type that they are, we have to always classify them. These are corresponding angles. You can see in line 3 we're being directed to work with vertical angles. And uh, let me back up a moment. If we say that angles are congruent, we better mark it in the diagram. So we're saying 1 and 3 are congruent. So there we are. And now we're looking at the vertical angles. We know 3 and 4 are congruent, so mark it on your diagram. And if they're marked on the diagram, you have to call them out by name. So angle 3 is congruent with angle 4. And that means if you take a look at, again, we're just focusing on the top half of the diagram. If you take a look at these, you can see, oh, well, if 1 is congruent to 3, and if 3 is congruent to 4, then what do we know about 1 and 4? They are also congruent. That's our transitive property, because we have three unique ingredients. And here they are listed. If 1 is congruent to 3, and 3, in turn, is congruent to 4, then what do we know about angles 1 and 4? They are congruent. So that's our transitive property of congruency, so POC. <coughs> So what you're seeing here is a flow of logic that all stemmed from this idea that we had parallel lines. If parallel lines, then corresponding angles are congruent. Then we bring in the vertical angles, and then we bring the transitive property. So what we're doing here is a little bit of a transition. Imagine for a moment that this is your first paragraph of an outline of your paper, and now we're transitioning to a second paragraph before we get to the conclusion itself. You can always think of a proof like an outline that you would create in writing an essay. And so that transition is hard to see when we just put everything in a column, but that's what this given statement is doing. It's sort of jumping from one train of thought to a new train of thought. Now we're saying, hey, remember, we had angles one and two congruent. So 
All of these angles are actually congruent, are they? So we can do another transitive property linking them together. Let's look at lines 4 and 5. If 1 is congruent to 4 and 1 is congruent to 2, then what do we know about 2 and 4? There they are. They're congruent as well, aren't they? So 2, angle 2, is congruent to angle 4. So obviously by looking at the diagram and the markings, you can see all the angles are congruent. That's great, but how is that going to help us prove that line P is parallel with line R? Well, if we're looking at line P and line R, uh, line R, then that means we need to look at two angles that are touching line P and line R. So now we're focusing on just the right side of the diagram, and we're ignoring angle 3 at the moment. Just look at line two and, uh, angles 2 and 4. Notice that they are on either side of this transversal at H. One is touching the line at P, and one angle is touching the line at R. We've learned in the past that if these alternate interior angles are congruent, and we now know they are, that means the lines they touch must be parallel. So we're going to create a final if then using line 6 and 7. So we would say if, now again we can't just say if angles are congruent, we have to classify them. If alternate interior angles are congruent, then it creates parallel lines. Now as you were working our way through this, um, you may have noticed that there's a lot of angles here. We kind of took the time to make sure all the angles were congruent with the others. And it turns out we could have done this in fewer steps. We could have done this proof in fewer steps because we could have skipped over some of these angles. And that's what we're using here in number two. This this is trying to illustrate the concept that there is really oftentimes many ways to do a proof, many correct ways to do a proof. And because we set them up in the structure that you see here in example one, you might think that's the only way it can be done. And yes, this is the only way it can be done with how we set up the given information and filled in some of the lines. But if we were to leave it totally blank, like what you see here on example two, well, we could have a bit more freedom in how we want to go about this. For example, we could take both pieces of given information and put them right on line one. So that would certainly save a step of the proof. Now again, we want to make sure this is marked, so mark angle one congruent with angle two. And again, we have the fact that looking at the top half of the proof, Again, starting off with, what do we know about these parallel lines? Well, these parallel lines are creating these corresponding angles that will be congruent. So that means angle 1 must be congruent with angle 3. So mark that on your diagram. And this is the same if then as you had in the previous proof on reason number 2. If parallel lines, then corresponding angles are congruent. So, where do we go from here? Again, this is going to be our transitive property. If angle 1 is congruent to angle 2, let me add that angle symbol in there, and angle 1 is congruent with angle 3, then what do we know about angles 2 and 3? Angle 2 must be congruent to angle 3 by the transitive property of congruency. And notice that in this way, we completely bypassed angle 4. So in the previous example, we were using vertical angles, and then we were using angles 4 and 2 as an alternate interior pair. Well, we can completely ignore angle 4 and just look at angles 3 and 2 and say, hey, you know what? Angle 3 is touching line P, and angle 2 is touching line R, so we can just go and use those two. And those are corresponding angles. So let's say line P is parallel with line R because if corresponding angles are congruent, then we have parallel lines. So these two examples are, are done back to back just to show you that there are more than one correct way of, of solving them often. And it can be hard to see that with an example like number one. So in example two, that's, that's how typically we would be doing proofs where we have to fill them in completely from scratch.
All right, let's turn the page over and look at number three. Here we are with uh, example three. So again, what I, what I really want you to do is I want you to try this on your own and then come back to the video and check your answer and just kind of listen to the thinking through it. All right, so go ahead and try it on your own first. Now, as we take a look at this, you can see again, we've got two pieces of given information. Line G is parallel with line H and that's already marked. We have a few angles identified here that we're focusing on and we know that angle one and angle two are supplementary, which doesn't have a symbol. We can't just mark something to say they are supplementary. We just have to keep a little mental note of what those are, but we're not talking about congruency, we're talking about supplementary. And if we want to show that P and R are parallel, then these are the only two angles we can work with. And those two angles we recognize as being consecutive interior. And we know that if they are supplementary, then the lines they touch will be parallel. So the question is, can we show in this proof that these two are supplementary? That's our goal. Okay, so you'll also notice here that we are splitting up the two pieces of given information. So we're starting off with the parallel lines and then we're taking that idea as far as we can and then once we get to line four we're transitioning to a different topic if you will. So think of lines one and three as like an outline of your first paragraph. Think of lines four through seven as the outline of a second paragraph before you get to the conclusion itself. So this given statement here, I'll go ahead and write in on statement four. So angle one and angle two are supplementary. All right, they are supplementary. So let's start off with the first three lines and just fill that in. If we have parallel lines, then we know something about these two angles. These two angles are in corresponding locations. So let's write an if then statement. All right, so if parallel lines, then corresponding angles are congruent. All right. Now, instead of trying to bring in the other angle, because we can't yet, because these are not congruent, we can't say anything about that. You'll see here with the reason three that we're transitioning from congruency to equality. We're saying the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle three. And the question is why? Why would we have to do that? Well, that's because of this next piece of given information. If we're talking about supplementary angles, that means we must have angles that add up to 180 degrees, meaning we have to have an equation. So I cannot use my knowledge of angles one and three when we're only talking about them as being congruent and plug them into the equation. No, no, we have to plug items that have an equal sign into other equations. So that's why we have to transition from congruency to equality so we can now use line three and plug that information into our coming equations. So lines one through three, we're just focusing on these two angles now we're transitioning to a new topic and saying, okay, now that we know angles one and two are supplementary, because we were told that, what does that mean? It means they add up to 180 degrees. So think of an if-then statement. So if two angles are supplementary, then they add to 180. That's also the definition of supplementary angles. So you could just write definition of supplementary angles. And now if you look at lines five and line six, this is not an if then, this is more of an algebra process. Notice the equations are almost exactly the same. However, we took angle one out and put angle three in its place. Why could we do that? Because angle one and angle three are exactly the same, right? So that's why we had to transition from congruency to equality, so we could do this substitution right here. So this is an algebra property, and so that's why we have to call it property of equality, POE, substitution POE. And now we're saying, all right, let's look at angle two and three. 
So they're not congruent, but we are saying they add up to 180. Well, we can't just say because they add up to 180, I have parallel lines. No, what we have to say is if these two angles are supplementary, then we have parallel lines. So we have to transition again from an equation back to a statement about supplementary angles. So we're kind of starting with supplementary angles, turning that into an equation, modifying the equation, and then we have to turn that equation back into the, a kind of a statement about supplementary angles. So now we say angle three and angle two are supplementary. And we know that because they add up to 180. So again, this is the same definition of supplementary angles. So as an alternative, on line five, you could have used definition of supplementary angles. And here on line seven, you could have also used that same definition of supplementary angles. Remember, we said that definitions are true forwards or backwards. Doesn't matter if you look at the if then or the converse, they're always true. So now we know that if these two angles are supplementary, then we have parallel lines. So we have to classify them. What kind of angles are they? They're consecutive interior. So if consecutive interior angles are supplementary, then we have parallel lines. So notice again, this is an idea we've studied before. And notice what it does not say. It does not say if consecutive interior angles add up to 180. No, it's if consecutive interior angles are supplementary. So again, that's why we had to transition from the equation to a statement saying that they are supplementary. All right, so here is our final proof for today. And again, like before, I want you to pause the video, think it through, try to solve it yourself, and then come back to the video to check your answer. All right, so pause the video and try it yourself. So you'll notice this proof is quite a bit different. In these notes, examples one through three were all involving parallel lines, and that's clearly not the case here. Here we are working with perpendicular lines. All right, and we can see that with these perpendicular lines, there's a third ray that is creating a pair of angles, and we're trying to prove that they are complementary. Now if you just think about it for a moment, if you have perpendicular lines, then that means this angle is a right angle. So it does make sense that seven and eight are going to be complementary, but complementary means that they add up to 90. So we actually have to say that this right angle equals 90, then we can add these two angles up to 90 to show that they are a complementary pair. All right, so as always, we're going to start off with that given information, and ray ED is parallel to, excuse me, perpendicular to ray EF, and that is, of course, given. All right, so think of an if-then statement. So here on line one, this is your if. Here, this is your then on line two. So if perpendicular rays, or say if perpendicular lines, then the angle formed is a right angle. So if perpendicular line. Now the reason I'm saying lines here is because this is the definition and rays are just part of a bigger object called lines. So this is the actual definition. If perpendicular lines, then right angle. So you could also say definition of perpendicular lines. That's the official name. All right. Now what do we know about right angles? We know right angles have a measure of 90 degrees. So again, think of this as another if then statement. So we would say if an angle is a right angle, if an angle is a right angle, then it measures 90 degrees. Now that's the definition of a right angle. So you could use that official title if you wanted instead. Now notice that we can't just jump from line one to line three. 
right? We know that we have perpendicular lines. I know they're raised in the diagram, but we know we have perpendicular lines. We know that would form an angle that has a measure of 90 degrees, but you can't just jump there in one step. You can't say, if I have perpendicular lines, then my angle is 90 degrees, because that's not what the definition says. The definition says that if I have perpendicular lines, then the angle is a right angle. So then we say, well, what do we know about right angles? Then we say the right angle has a measure of 90 degrees. So that's what the definition say. Notice that it does not say if perpendicular lines, then the measure is 90 degrees. Now that would be a blending of the two, and you can't mix and match parts in that way. The angle addition postulate, it's been a while since we've seen that, but that, remember, is adding angles. But you have to call them out by name. So what we're going to say is we're going to say that the measure of angle DEF, all right, that's the big one, can be found by adding together the measure of angle 7 plus the measure of angle 8. Right? It's the two angles that are next to each other that when added together create the big angle. But notice we're not saying that they add up to 90 degrees yet because what we have to do is we have to say that they're adding together to create the angle. We have to call it out by name. Then we do the substitution and plug in the 90 degrees from line 3 into this equation that we have here. So now we say 90 degrees is what we get when we add up the measures of angle 7 and 8. So that was our substitution right there from line 4 to line 5. So notice that the angle addition postulate is creating an equation, but it doesn't really use all the numbers. It doesn't use the values of the angles just yet. It just uses the names of the angles. And then we can plug in the numbers. And now that we have something that has numbers, we can say, okay, well, what is that describing? And that's clearly describing a complementary pair. So again, notice we're going from a statement to an equation, and then from an equation back to a statement again, because that statement is what we're trying to prove. So think of an if then, where line five is the if part, and line six is the then part. So we would say if two angles add to 90 degrees, then they are complementary. Do you know what definition that is? So alternatively, you could say uh, the official name is definition of complementary angles. And if you wanted to write that down instead of the if-then, you totally could as well.